<laughs> so uh, good afternoon and welcome to this week's Zestcast. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel McGuinness, the founder of Wake Up With Zest and the Zest Wellbeing Hub. Uh, on the Zestcast, we interview our expert contributors to the Zest Wellbeing Hub and also special guests as well. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our last Zestcast, if you were a part of it. We interviewed personal trainer Greg Harvey about rediscovering your fitness mojo. And for those of you who are on the Zestcast um, or have watched the recording, I hope you found your fitness mojo. But the recording is up on the um, Wake Up With Zest YouTube channel and also on the Zest Wellbeing Hub under Zestcasts. Today, we are interviewing the former international Irish rugby player, Peter Bracken, and we're going to be talking about what the workplace can learn from well-being in rugby. So please feel free to type questions or comments in the chat as we go along, and I'll be monitoring the, the chat box. And if everyone could be on mute, that would be fantastic to cut out any background noise or cats and dogs, kids or doorbells. Uh, there'll be opportunity to ask questions along the way. So um, if you want to ask a question, then please unmute yourself. So Peter, thank you so much for being a part of our Zestcast today. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Maybe what got you into rugby and who you've played for? Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Rachel, and delighted to be invited. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, Peter Bracken's uh, my name. So I'm um, obviously Irish, as I, you know, all I have to do is open my mouth and people get that pretty quickly. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I played, played rugby on, uh, since I was six years of age. I played all sorts of sports, multi-sports, whatever. I just love playing all different sports. I think it's a very good thing for kids to you know, uh, play as much sport, different types of sports as possible. And then you, you gradually uh, filter down to what you're best at. And it's generally the one you're best at is the one you m most enjoy. And it f rugby fitted my physical build, I suppose. You know, I was never going to be a long distance runner. So, um, yeah, I played rugby up through school and all that. And I played underage then with... Um, I'm from the province of Leinster, so I would have played my underage with Leinster and underage stuff with Ireland. And then I got my first uh, taste of professional rugby with Munster. I've actually played for three of the four provinces. So I played a couple of games with Munster, but at the time uh, I was kind of an up and coming uh, young lad and uh, I was thrown in against the the you know, the full internationals at a very young age, which was oh, great because yeah. you learned an awful lot. And yeah. I eventually, um, I went through uh, university or college at the time. And uh, when I finished that, I, uh, I, I got my first professional contract at 23 years of age. So, um, which wasn't unusual then because especially my position as a prop, but also, um, so Pretty much young lads coming out of school now go straight into the professional setup, which is fine. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time they do their education on the side. But with, with me back in my day, I suppose, uh, we were usually a little bit older to mature. So most of us did our college and whatever and then uh, went from there. So that was brilliant. Um uh, Played with Connacht professionally for four years. Um, then I went over um, and joined uh, Wasps, who were the European champions at the time. And we went on and won uh, another European Cup. And, and that was fantastic. I was in a squad of, you know, full internationals. And, you know, there was lots of games I played with Wasps that I was the only uncapped player in the whole 22 or 23 players. And, you know, that whole environment of high performance. And... Um, I ended up with uh, Bristol uh, for a year and Harlequins for a short time. And then I finished off over in France. So Wonderful. I experienced different types of levels of performance. For me, my two years at WAS was, was the highlight. Um, but, you know, there was very similar setups in the other places as well. But, um, you know, maybe small little things did make a difference Um between WASPs and other clubs at the time. So what did you study at university? Um, I did a degree in mechatronics. So it was electronic stroke uh, mechanical engineering. And um, 
I enjoyed it at the time. And when I finished playing rugby, I went back into that industry, but I'd lost the love of it over that time. And <laughs> I suppose I, uh, look, I sacrificed a lot to play rugby, but I suppose I had the dream job. And then when I went into the real world afterwards, you know, I went into that and for the first year or six months, I thought, oh, I was spoiled. I, I had just played, you know, I had the dream job and now this is reality. And I thought it was that, but no, I kind of lost the love of kind of engineering or whatever. And um, then I went into coaching and um, all kind of, you know, I, I re-educated myself. I got into executive coaching and really enjoyed that. And um always intrigued about human behavior and organizational behavior and, and, and change and, and all that. And, and very recently, well, I suppose in the last two, three years, I've, uh, you know, I've dedicated most of my time to um, learning and, and raising awareness of climate solutions. Mm. You know, we, as human beings, we have the biggest challenge we've ever faced in humanity. And we've about four, Four generations of human beings left on the planet if we continue to do what we're doing but thankfully all those solutions are out there so I'm, I'm making people aware through sport um how and how sport can can beat this climate emergency that we're, we're facing and you know what it's all good news because everything there is is going to get us through so we're we're going to be fine we Fantastic. just need to <laughs> Everyone needs to make little changes, not huge changes. Absolutely. So, so it's it's well-being of ourselves, others, and the planet. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. In a nutshell, Rachel. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> You're good at this. <laughs> I'm a former marketer. Um, so, uh, we were, when we were talking about doing this uh, Zestcast, we were talking about yoga and how the world of rugby adopted yoga quite early on, and how do you convince a whole load of blokes to do yoga? Well, actually, quite easily, because you just tell them, you, you don't tell them it's yoga. You tell them, oh, it's a performance stretching or, you know, come up with your own uh, thing and then um, uh, tell them it's going to improve their performance and you will get it. And then, you know, a couple of sessions in, they're kind of thinking, oh, this is a little bit like yoga, is it? I think like my girlfriend does something like this or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, um, yeah. So you might reword it, you know, uh, you know, neuro linguistic programming is a very powerful thing. So, you know, you can, <laughs> but you know, look, the majority, look, I suppose it's like anything else. Um, Rugby's diff uh, there's different characters, but I suppose one thing we, we would all have in common, whether it's male, female, uh, but basically sport in general, at especially at a higher level, is that you just want to get better. So you're willing to do anything to get better. One thing I do find is men don't need to know why they're doing it. We are kind of, we just do it because we're, yeah, whatever way. We're a bit, yeah, maybe we don't need the why. Whereas ladies need oh why am i doing this why am i doing this so which is fine that's the only difference i've found between you know coaching uh, ladies and coaching coaching gents um um but yeah uh, so get, get them doing that and uh, now you know like even with me back in my day i suppose i was always open so if someone said to me look uh, if, if you if you try yoga it, it'll improve this no problem I'd have done it. Other guys would be, oh, I'm not doing that. That's that's for girls or whatever. Um, but all but all of a sudden, if they can see another player getting the benefits of it, they'll switch very very quickly. But I do find if you can re <laughs> rename it to something that's not yoga, you might have a better chance. <laughs> <laughs> so all the teams that you were working or you were playing for, did they all do yoga? Yes, yes. Um, well, do you know what? No, sorry, no. Um, by the time I was finishing, they were, but not when I started. So, you know, no one was doing that. St I suppose like uh, 20 years ago, no one was doing it. And by the time I finished up 10 years ago, you know, teams were getting into it. Now, 
you know, five up to five years ago. So everyone's doing it now. Everyone's doing it now. You know, I suppose when they start doing, started doing it 10 years ago, it took four or five years to see the results. And then all of a sudden, every team is looking at the teams that are winning stuff and, oh, where did they get their little advantage? And, you know, that might be yoga, might be Pilates, it might be um, extra stretch and stuff, it might be mindfulness, whatever it is. And, um, and then to do it. So, you know, a lot of well-being stuff is a stable of high performing sport for at least the last five years. And it started maybe 10 years ago. Um, uh, but, you know, the team, but we started it even before that with Wasps. Like I suppose the, the best team I had or that I played with or the peak of my career was in, in Wasps. And we were better... For a lot of reasons, you know, we quality coaches and quality talent, quality players and a great work ethic and great culture. But part of that culture is that we tried different things. And, you know, if they worked great, we kept on. And if they didn't, you know, move on to the next thing. Like we were just for a strength and conditioning point of view, we were doing what they call, well, what we called uh, power endurance so that was like heavy heavy intensity uh, for a sustained period of time breaks intensity it's basically hit training yes with yeah but um it wasn't called hit back then no one knew what it was no one else was doing it so we got in there first but it was I suppose the open-minded of the coaches and the strength and conditioners and the players to do it and then we do it and so we were a couple of years ahead. So that's why we were winning stuff. And then, you know, you know, the articles come out. Oh, why, why it was? What's the difference? What's the edge they're going? And it came out that we were doing this. Then every other team is doing it. But by <laughs> the time I left was, we probably moved on to something else. And, and you know, um, but now hit training is, is running. Well, it's not running the mill. It's like no one wanted to do it because it's very difficult, you know. So um, tra training change. It's one of those things you get a lot of bang for your buck with, though, isn't it? Because it's it's quick. Yes. But, but you do get a lot in a short amount of time. Exactly, exactly. And it works. It works for rugby players because uh, and a lot of contact sports people because we don't mind pain. So we don't mind getting hit, but we don't like prolonged stuff. We mightn't have it. You know, might get lots of knocks in the head and, you know, our concentration, you know, so for steady running, like when you're 20 stone weight or 18, 20 stone weight, running at a consistent pace for three hours is is tough going. And no one likes doing that when you're big. But if you're big, you don't mind running into stuff and, you know, blasts of 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, or what, which is what rugby is. You know, there's high intensity, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, then you get a rest high intensity rest, high intensity rest. And that's why HIT worked for us because it replicated rugby a lot better. Now, you know, you need the endurance base. Of, of course you do. Um, and, you know, there was the traditional long runs and then, you know, more athletic type training, like 400 meter runs and stuff, which was all fantastic. Um, but I suppose we at WASP were the first to kind of move on to HIT once we had that base and, um, you know, uh, and, you know, the whole mindfulness, the imagery um, and, and general well-being, because a healthy person is a happy person. A happy person is a high performing person. That's really the way it goes. And high performing, you get winners then. And, and we've talked about mindfulness and you mentioned something to me about red brain and blue brain. Would you like to tell us more about yeah. that? Yes, yes. I, I suppose there's a famous book called Legacy from David Kerr. K-E-R-R, -R, is it David? Is it Kerr, and a legacy. And it's all about the All Blacks and why the All Blacks are the most winningest team in sport ever. And the New Zealand rugby team. And he mentioned it. Um, now, we, we had it. Um, so what, what it is, is... Um, now, when I was at Wasps and that, we had this, but we there was no real name on it. It was just like keep calm, and you know, you know, sometimes you need to really go hard, and then others you have to keep calm. So, calm is the blue brain, like I'm controlled, I'm calm, I'm ice cold, I'm cool, 
Um, and then red brain is right. I really have to. I have to smash someone. I have to do whatever. Um, and you can go in and out of those. And but when you're in a red brain, it's important to have a control. Like when you say red, it's not just fiery red going crazy, you know. And the brain, like yeah. You know, so when when you see somebody on a pitch in any sport, and you know. When you see like Eric Cantona doing a karate kick into the crowd or whatever, you know, the red brain has gone overboard in that, you know. Um, and then if, if you see another person who's just so easy going and calm that their blue is too low. So it's, it's, it's all that getting it right. And, and it's recognizing like that the red mist is another way of describing it. Has that come in? So, so red and blue. And you have to be able to recognize where you are and how to adjust it accordingly. And, you know, like if you're in red brain, that could be the right time to be in red brain. Keep going. But, you know, when you take a break or you need to rectify a mistake or whatever, you need to have, yeah, be able to think. And did you ever do any kind of like meditation and things like that before a match or to sort of come down after a match? Yeah, um, imagery was a big one for me uh, personally. And I learned that very, very young, like when I was in academy. So, you know, I'm, like 25 years ago, um, uh, I was still in school and I learned about imagery. Now, again, you know, half the guys in the squad would have been laughing at it. Oh, that was, that was, we were on a jolly there for an hour lying on the floor thinking about <laughs> stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, you know, I, I, I took it more seriously and, and a lot of guys did as well. So, you know, um, and for me, it worked because you'd be able to visualize what you're doing. And um, I don't know the scientific words behind it, but there's two types of imagery. There's imagery where you are looking at yourself doing it as if you're looking at yourself on television and what you're going to do. And then there's the other one where you're actually in it. Like it's, it's what do they call a point of view video? Like, yeah, that, yeah you're running through it. And, and both of them now to find the point of view more effective, generally speaking, or if you've only five minutes to do either, do the point of view one or whatever. So, so you know, so basically it's replay, re, replaying games in your head before you actually do them. So, that it's not a shock to the system and, and you've done it so, so many times. And, you know, like the way we were told, like if you've 30 games a season, you know, that's that's pretty hard going on the body. So you can't play 300 games a season. It's not physically possible, but you can play 300 games in your head, you know, in a relaxed state. Now it's not, you know, it's like anything else you can't, go silly with that either you know but um i would i would have done in imagery every day i'm not a planny well i am planned but i i used to prefer like you know just spur the moment like five minutes here five minutes there and we're running thing i i other people are better at right um you know half an hour slot in the evening time that's my um visual time they need whereas i i'll do six five minute slots throughout the day as i'm going along and and stuff like that so whatever works for 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 yourself um so the Im imagery was good but that kind of leads on to mindfulness but oh the, the imagery as well we were taught about positive imagery at the time and it's like, oh, I'll do this and I'll do great and I'll have a good scrum and I'll make an amazing tackle and the crowd will be, you know, and, and that's all brilliant. But what we didn't learn, what came later, how it, that's all well and good. But what if it doesn't? What, what if you miss a tackle and what if you are had a bad scrum and your head is down and you're thinking, we didn't learn how to. So that's another, that's how imagery has evolved and mindfulness has evolved that, yes, you're looking for the perfect scenario and that reinforces the chances of the perfect scenario happens. But you also have to train that if the perfect scenario doesn't happen, if the mistake happens, how, how you're going to react to that. In, and you're not going to get too down. You're going to be disappointed. Right. I shouldn't have done that. Let's refocus, whatever, and not, you know, get so upset over it that it 
it, it kills the rest of your game. So, you know, and and that has evolved as well. So you, you need to be able to do both. Uh, so you mentioned Pilates. So that's something that was originally attributed to, to ballet. Um, so what did you use Pilates for? Was it for when you're like lifting players in line outs? Yeah, yeah, it was a strong core, really. Hmm. And, um, you know, everything revolves around the core. And, um, you know, for all players, no matter what you do, but it was, it was mainly the front rowers, the front five, really, that did that because... Um, you know, we're in the scrum and there's huge impacts there and it's going down through your whole body, but your weak point is your midsection, you know, so you need, and most people from lifting weights and out that have a strong back, but, you know, injuries, back injuries normally happen because of a weak core and, yeah. you know, guys will do all the sit-ups because they want the six pack in that, which is fine. So that's an easy sell. That's an easy sell. Everyone wants the six pack, but, you know, the core is, different or smaller muscles and pilates and um i don't know what it was it was sold to us <laughs> it definitely wasn't sold to us as pilates okay <laughs> in the real early days now 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 you can sell it to a rugby team as pilates because yes. of course yeah it's part of our trade like you know when 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 players go into an academy or a county set up as they're making their way up at 15 16 they're, they're being introduced to Pilates at 14, 15 years of age, whereas we weren't introduced until we were 25. So we've all this barrier stuff, you know. So it's um, so you could tell a 15 year old now, you know, that Pilates is part of it. And, you know, um, uh, but what, you know, so a core, yeah, it was core exercise, core strengthening, core strength. Oh, yeah, straight, <laughs> macho, <laughs> fine, you know. So yeah. there were <laughs> Yeah. And and what about nutrition? Were you given lots of advice about nutrition? Uh, yes. Yeah. And from an early age as well, you know, I suppose a lot of this, a lot of the base was done in the academy kind of level, like when we're 18, 19, 20. Now, nowadays, guys are getting into sub academies at 14, 15, 16. So it's coming that couple of years earlier. Um, and that's why guys are coming out of school and playing professional rugby, whereas I was 23 before I did it. So you're just a couple of years ahead of it. Um, and like, yeah, nutrition, diet and that. And, you know, um, it's important that um, guys get good nutrition in early and, and they're young. And, um, you know, but I, I suppose with rugby, you're always everyone's trying to gain bulk and whatever ever and you know that can be contra that is controversial even in rugby like how big do guys need to get is that too bulky is that counterproductive all that kind of stuff you know and then does it lead into you know cheating or does it lead into overeating and stuff but my thing was like to be a top class professional rugby player it's not it's not a balanced diet. It's it's and it's it's not a healthy diet in the long run. So basically, you have to pack your body with protein and 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 good food to be as big and strong as you can, but also run around the place. So yeah. But, but most guys, when they stop, they go back to a normal healthy diet. So you know, I I don't think you can eat fourteen chicken breasts a day or that amount of protein. For, for more than 10 years before it becomes, you know, bad for you, you know. So, look, you've 10 years at the top, you know, you've might maybe another five getting there. So you're 15 to 20 years at the, you know, so you're going to do it because you want to be the best you do. Like, but, you know, um, I wouldn't say it's healthy for a long time thing. And yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I suppose it's the same with any sport, really. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would think, I would think, yeah, um, like I, I do remember um, Steve Redgrave, yes. um, you know, when he, like he became diabetic, like mm. was that down to his diet or would he have done it anyway? Now it's just type two. So, mm. you know, the chances are it wasn't a natural kind of thing. And um, I think Steve was type, or was he type one? But anyway, um, you know, the amount of, physical stuff he put in and, and eating and, and all that um, mightn't have helped at the end. Like I, I did really read, like on a physical point of view, 
Steve had to do almost the same amount of training for the year afterwards or to lower so his heart and everything would be okay. And, you know, we're, we're kind of, yeah, taught to do that. But I suppose in that year afterwards, you're so kind of fit anyway, you kind of do that naturally. But it is kind of said, look, you want to keep yourself fit. And if you're going to drop, you can't do the same training as you are for the rest of your life. But, you know, for that year, maybe gradually lower down to a manageable, normal uh, type of level so that your body kind of ad adapts to it. So um, it's like coming off drugs, isn't it? <laughs> it kind of is. It kind of is. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> like when I give up, well, not that I give up, no, sorry. When I finished playing rugby, I um, um, I ended up doing MMA, so mixed martial arts for two years afterwards and pretty much training at that high intensity because, you know, I uh, you know, I had a year or two left in me of, of and that's what I decided to do. And then gradually I, I kind of cut down and just do it for recreational and stuff mm. now, you know, so... Um, and do they teach you about sleeping? So that's one of my pet subjects. I love talking about sleep. Yeah, yeah. Um, not that's something I've learned pretty much after rugby. Again, that's standard nowadays, you know. So like I like in in oh when I think of it, like in June, I'm gonna be 10 years retired from professional rugby. Like I, I like it's I was a professional for 10 years. So in June, I'm going to be as long retired as I played, which is a bit scary. So, you know, things have moved on. Like for like I was doing stuff off the cuff, not of my own volition, not part of the team because I thought it was going to be a benefit of now it's it's standard practice. Like, uh, you know, acupuncture and I, I see a cop chiropractor a couple of times a year. Just not that there's anything wrong, but just to keep myself uh, right. Um but what did you ask me there? I'm after going. Oh, that's sleep. Oh, sleep. Yeah. yeah, sleep. No, I personally wasn't, but I think that is standard in any rugby club now, or again at academy level, or something like you know, young girls and boys are at 14, 15, 16 are learning about to sleep, the sleep cycle, and and what I I've only learned about sleep cycle in the last two or three years myself, and it it makes sense. Like my mum. You know, my granny said, oh, you need eight hours sleep. And technically you need seven and a half or whatever because of the hour and a half cycle. But, you know, I think eight hours is good because ah, by the time you kind of really get to sleep, you know, 15 minutes and then, you know, you're kind of awake. And, you know, I like that 10 or 15 minutes at the end just to actually get out of bed. So, you know, um, I, I didn't know there was a half, an hour and a half sleep cycle. And, you know, so sleep six hours, sleep seven or, or sleep seven and a half or sleep nine Beyond nine, it gets counterproductive that's, too. That's that's right, and and I guess what they're teaching now is uh, with with um, so they, I, I guess sleep science is really just they'll come on in the past, I don't know five or six years, okay. but uh, if teams were playing away, and of course you're sleeping in hotel rooms, uh, and you may not get a great night's sleep, no. and are you at a disadvantage if you're uh, the away team playing at a match? Oh, you, you are, you are. No, you you certainly are. And, you know, if there was one thing I'd love to have known was about about sleep uh, back in my day, because you'd be in a stuffy hotel and that, so you try and open up the windows and stuff. Some of them you can't open. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I know. You know, yeah, exactly. We all, we've all, we all know that. And so, yeah, the sleep is, is a bit... Uh, all over the place so you, you know look it's it's there's two reasons why most teams you win more games at home than you do away and one one is because you want to defend your home you know it's 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 like that whatever your you know caveman cave woman thing you know it's it's your the threats coming in you're going to defend your home and your family and and your plus you know like yeah you have gone away the opposition have had a nice cozy night's sleep that you probably haven't had because you're in a new, even in a new bed, even a new bed. Now, guys, I never did. And, but, and probably looking back, it's one thing I probably should have done, but you know, was um, 
guys that bring their own pillow. That's fairly standard practice now. You know, that the one thing you can bring in with you is your own pillow. So at least that's the same. And I find that good. Now, you will get lads really on to huge lengths as well. Um, I know Jamie, Jamie Heaslip used to have a sleep tent. So he's sleeping, he, but the thing was, he had to sleep in a 365. So even at home, he had a tent at the end of the bed. And his thing was, well, even when I go away, it's still the same sleep, you know. Mm. Um, and But he had an oxygen thing going as well. So, you know, um, uh, again, so each to their own. But, um, you know, if you have a cryogenic chamber in your room and you want to bring it around with you, by all means do. Um, and he had a bloody good career out of it. So, you know, but I suppose there's, the limit, there's a limit to what you can do. Like, you can't do everything a you know, certain amount of hours in the day, what works for you? And yeah, different things work for, for, for different people, you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, I know that, I know the cycling teams are very much into the, uh, into the sleep and um, I can't remember, is it Chris Brailsford? And they, they have like a team of people that everyone has their own sort of pillow and mattress that they actually take to the hotels and they sort of black out all the windows so that they get a great night's sleep before they're off cycling the next day. So, um, but if you're in a, on a coach <laughs> going over somewhere in Europe, you can't take all that stuff with you. Yes, um, yeah. So would you say that uh, in women's rugby, uh, are they better at the well-being than the men than men, or is it all the same? I think it's all the same um, because um, you know, look, I've coached men's uh, and I've coached women's uh, sport uh, rugby um, and. They just want the best coaches. They just want the best stuff. Like generally, the higher you up you go, like um, like the All Blacks don't care if if there's four women coaching them because the whole co- because they just want the best coaches. And the same with ladies. Ladies don't care whether man, woman, child, or whatever. You, once you have the best coaches, so you know. I think nowadays, definitely open to it. I think at the real high level even the most macho kind of lad is more is open to other stuff. Like, I think it is easier, like back in the, you know, 10 years ago, I think it would have been easier to sell Pilates to women rugby players than it was to male rugby players. And we had to change the name to core strengthening for the lads, Pilates for the women, whatever. Like calling it core strength mightn't have appealed to women as much back then. Who knows? I don't know. Um, But so whatever, whatever works. But I, I think you can call Pilates Pilates now for, for either. Now, again, it's like anything else. I found, um, you know, the lower down you go, the more resistance you get. Like going to, you know, the local third 15 drinking, swallowing beer team. You know, you're not, you barely get those lads to go training, never mind sleep but I, I think at the higher levels anyone playing first team even a club rugby you know um, if you're playing for your first team no matter what level it is if it's level you know if it's international or if it's level 10 but it's first team rugby it's serious stuff like you you know you're training con- con- continually at least twice a week you're in the gym you're doing your fitness work yeah guys are and ladies are doing their Pilates they're doing their extra stretching they're doing those little things that do make a difference and they're very open to uh, someone coming in and talking about sleep for an hour. Mm. Absolutely. Fantastic. So is there anything else that you'd like to share with us about how wellbeing and rugby can teach the world of business a little bit more? Yeah. um, Basically it's worked and it is working in sport. So, you know, um, it works. So, at least have to think about it. I would say it works, so do it, but, you know, at least have the conversation with someone and try it and, and try it properly, not a token try. Oh, we got we got this lady in for a half an hour. Oh, it didn't work. Of course not. You have to do it consistently over a consistent period. So sign up for something consistent and proper. And do you know what? You'll continue it because it's going to work. And, um, you know, but it's getting every, it's like anything else. It's getting people on, getting everyone on board before you commit to something. It's, yeah, 
it's 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 more difficult in organizations. We all know that, whether it's business or sport, to land something on someone. Yeah. Bring them in. You know, like like I've no problem. Um oh like I suppose in back of my day, you know, before I went pro, I I I was doing a bit of brick lane for about a year just to whatever and guys and I used to carry loads of bricks up and down and run up and down stairs because it was good training and guys would be laughing at me or whatever but they weren't laughing at me three years later when they were watching me on the telly you know so but those <laughs> uh, but but even lads like that and uh, you know um everyone wants happiness and you know like but you need that little bit of open mindedness to to be happy and you know um i find no matter what trade or what work you're in open mindedness or closed mindedness there's no class or there's no um there's no division you know like you can have the most open minded bricklayer in the world that will try Pilates and that and then you'll get the top executive who you know is is giving TED talks who won't try it you know so um yeah uh, give it a go you, you know and um you you know you, you don't know who's open to it and who's not and then you know if you get a few people that are open to it well then it kind of evolves and and once they're working and, 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 and things spread from there, you know, but long and short of it, if you want to bring something in, you know, a group of guys just for say, and, you know, there's a bit of macho-ness going around there, oh, Pilates or whatever, just say, well, the All Blacks do it, yeah. you know, the, the, yeah, the English rugby team do it, the MMA guys do it, so, you know, if it's good enough for them, it's probably good enough for you. That's how I got my partner into, into uh, yoga, I said the uh, England team do it. There you go. And they do. Like that's they, they do. That's not a lie. Exactly. You're not, yeah. yeah, they do it. Absolutely. Yeah. So what yeah. three tips would you give us to take away? Um, do you know what? I'll give you four. Oh good. <laughs> Extra one. Bargain. Yeah. Like uh basically work exercise, work exercise, nutrition and friends and family. So we could, you, that could even be five, you know, but it, it's like, give yourself me time, if you can at all, um, you know, enjoy what you're working at. And if you're not enjoying it, uh, m- maybe build towards doing what you would like to do, you know, um, exercise, doesn't matter what it is, you don't have to do everything. You know, it, it, there's no point me, if I'm only an hour in the, in the week, Am I going? To, no, everyone has. That's that's wrong. That's a silly thing. Like everyone has a half an hour day at least, or whatever. But am I going to spend a half an hour day lifting weights, or am I going to spend a, a half an hour uh, doing Pilates? I'm going to probably lift lift the heavy objects because I enjoy it more. It'll work the core and all that. But you know, if I do it four times a day, I'll, I'll you know I might lift the weights four times a day a week, and I might do the Pilates once a week. So you know. Um, exercise you know and you know especially now friends friends and family are very very important you know so it's it's like the chair actually Declan Kidney who's now coaching London Irish and he coached Ireland he won a Grand Slam Mm. coached Ireland Munster all the rest Uh, I remember having a chat with him as you know 19 20 year old starting out and he he used the analogy of the legs of the legs of the table you know most legs of most sorry legs of a chair so most chairs have four legs and so you have to have a balance in that so exercise friends work diet and if one of them is skewed so one is longer than the other or one is short than the other the whole yeah you know, there's probably plenty of analogies like that so tr- try and keep them all especially there will chair. be times that you know, one has to outweigh. So <laughs> I, I found that good. That actually stuck to me for 25 years. Fantastic. Yeah. Good. So has anybody got any questions that they like to ask Peter? I have a question, yes. Oh, thank hello. you. Mr. Bracken. <laughs> hello, hi. John. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. And, and thank you for hosting this wonderful show, Rachel. I think your lineup is fabulous for these Zest casts mm-hmm. over the next three or four weeks with uh, with Nikki and Gail and Sandy. It's 
going to be very, very interesting and, and well worth a view. But I have a question for Peter and for you, Rachel, because a lot of what you were talking about there relates to what I would call marginal gains. Mm. Okay, so, so you're looking for a slight edge and they call it the slight edge model. You're looking for a slight edge to perform a little bit better and it could be stretching, it could be Pilates, it could be nutrition, it could be sleep, all of those things. You referenced the, the cycling team as well, Rachel, with the, the marginal gains model that sort of, you know, got down to the granular level of how heavy is the saddle on the bike, you know, this type of stuff. And I'm just curious, uh, from a rugby perspective, Peter, where is this going in the future? What will the kids of today who are training hard and want to be just like you in 10 or 15 years time, mm -hmm. what sorts of things are they going to be doing in the next five years that you know are coming down the pike to give them that little bit of edge in terms of performance? And similarly with you, Rachel, what can you see as the additional marginal gains to help us just perform better as humans in relationships or whatever it might be? Mm. You go first, Peter. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's a great one, John. Mm. And uh, I can't see who's in here, so it's a uh, great. Um, um, yeah, the marginal gains uh, for the future. Um, yeah, it is the marginal gains, and I think it was the Sky Cycling team that really mm. in on that. You know, if I'm if I'm right, um, and then it came into rugby and all that kind of. Um, probably, most probably, like. Look, we're, we're, we're always going to improve, but are we getting close to the physical limits? Now, without turning rugby players into American footballers that are 350 pounds and can run 100 metres, and, you know, we might it, we might be going that way in rugby physically, uh, but will that make rugby a better game? I doubt it. But the only thing holding us back is we have to play 80 minutes of rugby. So, um I think the more advances would be the psychological or, or mental part of the game. Um, that, that's one thing that we didn't have very much of was um, sports psychology. And going back to the red and blue brain is is to stay calm and focused uh, when things aren't going right. Like we had a lot of training around how to go well when things are going well, but that's kind of easy. Well, it's not, you know, um, whereas I think there's more, there has been more to gain uh, and that's come into sport, it's, you know, um, but that could be going, you know, I, I think we, we may have only brushed the surface of our psychological or mental sporting capacity. We could be quite close to the physical. So, um, you know, I, uh, like sports psychologists are becoming the norm now. Uh, we didn't have a sports psychology, even though it was any team I played in. Now, you know, if you're a professional sports team and you don't have a sports psychologist, well, you're not at the races at all. And how dare. Um, in, in rugby, again, you're getting guys talking to sports psychologists at a very young age, which can only be a good thing. So how, where does that, who knows with the brain, the power of the brain? That's a great question. John, I, I, I think if I'm betting on it, the advances, the big advances from now on, probably the small advances will still be physical, but I think there's more potential for big advances in the, the mental side of mm. games and sport in general. Rachel, what do you think? Um, I suppose my take on it is different. Mm. So my, my four chair legs are sleep, healthy eating, fitness and resilience so that takes on mental health and stress so so mm -hmm. i think everybody is at a different point of their well-being journey so everyone can make marginal gains no one is ever 100 mm percent -hmm. uh so we can always make improvements and then as an organization looking after people's uh, sort of workplace well-being as an organization they can always make marginal gains. And I think what the pandemic has taught all these uh, different companies and organizations is that they have to look after their staff. They have to look after their, their humans. And 
And I think it's good for organisations to have uh, difference or well-being initiatives to show that they, they care, that they are looking after their workforce so that they can get the marginal gains in the well-being of their staff and happiest, healthier staff are more productive in, and engaged. So that's my take on it. I hope I've answered that question for you, John. Uh, you have, right? That's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else got any questions? So yep. Tracy asked about um, the techniques the team used to focus on the game. So you were talking about visualization, weren't you, um, Peter? This is where you were talking about the red and the, the blue brain, because Tracy, you just, I think you just missed that bit. Oh, yeah. So will I go through that really quickly? Or, um, or well, is there anything else um, that you could maybe sort of add to that? No, not not really. Basically, the blue brain is is that you keep calm and relaxed and focused, and then the red brain is right. You have to go for it when, but that has to be controlled. So red and blue brain. So you know, generally in rugby, when the blood is boiling and guys are getting angry and whatever, they they might have to be brought from red back into blue. Um, it's easy to get guys into red, especially guys. I think girls can. Ladies can get back into blue a little bit quicker, I think. Um, uh, yeah, and um, and being able to do that. And sometimes you might recognise in yourself. That's where t teammates, like, that you're all saying, you all know about this. It's not just one guy knows about, like, you all do. So if you spot, and that's where the trust comes in. So if you spot your the guy next to you and he's getting, like, really flustered and angry, so you just say, Never say calm down. That's one thing I never say to people. <laughs> so don't tell me to calm down. <laughs> no, no, don't ever tell anyone to calm down because that just brings them into not calming down. And uh, But have trigger words. That was the other thing. Sorry, trigger words that, you know, mm. a word that triggers, even blue or, you know, use color, whatever, that um, or Sean is beside me. Sean, blue. Oh, all right, okay. Peter has spotted that, okay, I've gone a bit red, I need to turn to blue. So, like, you don't have time to have an in-depth, heart-to-heart discussion when you're about to scrum, you know, in, in three seconds' time. You just say, uh, you know, Sean, blue. And, and that might just reset him into, right, I need to get to blue. Fantastic. Um, Mark, you've got a question. Yeah, it was uh, more an observation, really. Um, thanks, Peter and Rachel, a very interesting session. And um, as one of the, uh, the pint swilling uh, rugby players that you refer to, Peter, um, you know, I spent many years watching Wasps when you were when you were playing there and saw, you know, Warren Gatland and Ian McGeekin and Sean Edwards make those incremental changes uh, and, you know, saw the gradual improvement. And, and obviously Wasps success was, uh, you know, a, a symptom of those gradual improvements that were made. And those things sort of filter down over the years. You know, they say that, you know, a Formula One racing car now has technology that will eventually appear in, in cars. In, and it's, so it's proven with the electric stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way, these things filter down. So, you know, in my sort of junior rugby clubs, nobody had ice baths. <laughs> they do now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, these things might take five or ten years yeah. to filter down, but they do filter down. And all these little incremental things make a difference. And I think you can apply a lot of those things in business as well. You know, so a lot of things that you might learn when you play sport, even if it's only recreational sport, you learn and you can apply them to your business life as well. So I'm sure there are things that you learned, Peter, from pro sport that you now apply in, in, in business these days. And um, it just shows the benefit of, of having a sporting background, I think, as well. Oh, no, absolutely, Mark. And, and it's great to hear that feedback that you could actually see that, you know, in the and Like, I haven't heard that before um, for someone that would have watched back then, you know, um, and seen that gradual uh, improvement. Um, and yeah, ice bats all. Yeah, we were doing the ice. We had a cryogenic bat, so it swirled around, the water swirled around because it gets even colder. Like their standard now, but like we, you know, we were completely um, off the charts. And yeah. that's absolute crazy stuff. Well, you it know. Was, it was considered crazy in those days, but now it's sort of standard form, isn't it? So it's, it's standard um, form. It's and interesting, you know. 
Yeah. So I, I, I no. do have one crucial question for you. Yeah. Who's going to win the Six Nations? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Looking like Wales now, isn't it? <laughs> We've already won the Triple Crown. So, uh, yeah. Um, probably got to rub it green, but sometimes you, you, you deserve it. You know, it's... Yeah. Everyone, it's it's a typical Six Nations. Anyone can beat anyone else, you know. It's true, actually. Yeah. And, and as, a, as a die as a diehard England fan, I think we were well beaten on Saturday. The referees not an ex wasn't was just an excuse. I think yeah, we were well yeah. beaten. I know, no, yeah, Wales were the better team, definitely. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, they were, and uh, we might have turned a corner against Italy. We could, you know, we might have a good run in to the end of it, but it's too late for Ireland yeah. anyway. Too late for Ireland this year. Yeah. Yeah, worry. Ireland is building. Yeah. <laughs> that, that old chestnut job. <laughs> yeah, I think England have been building as well over this true, six nations, true, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it. sorry, I'm, I'm hijacking the I'm hijacking oh. the call with rugby talk. Sorry. <laughs> Not at all. Um, but but that's a fair point you made, John. Like it's the transferring from sport into and I suppose we have an extra. I really do feel we have an extra advantage going from rugby because it's the ultimate team sport even people outside of rugby look at rugby and say it's the really it is because um it has that like you have to look after each other you can't and uh, and with a team and all that and even compared to rugby league which you know obviously is the closest to rugby union i played rugby league for for when or for a year or two and i just found it was more like one brilliant, brilliant player can win a rugby league match for you, whereas one one brilliant, brilliant player can't win it uh, in rugby union. Um, now there's other sports like you know, well you can't you can't win any team game without you know, and a matter what sport like there's individual sports and there's team sports, um, and like to be successful, not even to be successful, but just to be involved in in them is a huge thing. Like when I came out of rugby, all the soft skills that you learn about leadership, team building, like that comes naturally. I don't know anything else since I was six years of age, but I found 10 years ago when I retired that it was of no use uh, for me getting into the, all that it was was, oh, have you got 20 years experience in this? No, I don't. But, you know, I've, I, I've played in teams. What's the job? Oh, it's about um, managing people and leadership. OK, well, I'm perfect. Oh, Peter, you're not really because you don't have 10 years of biomechanical whatever. Uh, so but I think companies are are changing that, that, you know, it's it's easier to learn the technical stuff. But it's those soft skills that you can bring from from sport that kind of uh, come naturally. Like, not that I've employed anyone. Like, you know, I'm, I, I've always been self. Well, I've been self-employed since I whatever. And it's only really been me. That could change. But from my experience, trying to go for a job, if I was hiring someone, I I I would look at their hobbies first before anything else. I don't know now that that could be easy for me to say because I have never hired anyone, and as soon as I need to hire one, that could go all out the window. But I think the hobbies are very important. Like what do they do? What do they enjoy doing? Um, you know, like like I okay, I retired into a recession. And everyone struggled for jobs, you know, 10 years ago. Um, but any professional rugby player, I can only speak about rugby, but, you know, any sport really. If so, yeah, the day someone, yeah, I think the day someone retires from sport, they should be hired straight away. You, you should, don't even wait. Just give them a job and find a place for them because it's, it, it, they will, um, where, I don't think that's the case yet. Like I, even now, guys are fine. Can find a difficult transition into the next work workplace. Um, but yeah, it'd be anyway. Those transferable skills are very important. I think in all yeah. sports. Yeah, ab absolutely. So um, everyone, if you've enjoyed this Zestcast, please uh, post about it on social hashtag Zestcast, and our handles are at Wake Up With Zest on all our channels. So our next. Zestcast is next Thursday, and that's March 11th at 4.30pm. 
And we're going to be chatting to style and image expert Gail Morgan about personal branding in an online world. Uh, you can find out all about our upcoming Zestcast um, if you go to zestwellbeinghub.com forward slash Zestcast and you can register for them there as well. On 18th March, we're speaking to health and fitness expert Sandy Donnelly. I'm going to be talking about the benefits of juicing. Uh, on the 25th of March, we're speaking to women's health and hormone expert Nikki Williams about perimenopause and menopause. And we're going to be promoting the April Zestcast from next week. So topic, topics coming up are mindfulness, yoga, meditation and hypnotherapy. And if you're having trouble sleeping at the moment, Zest Sleep School starts on the 19th of March and registration is uh, now open. So I'll put a slide up with all the contact details for that. So Peter, thank you so much for your time today and inspiring us with all your um, tales of rugby. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for having me. I've really, really enjoyed it. And really. Uh, enjoy talking to the guys um, there as well. It's it's fantastic. Uh, Good, and thank you to everyone for attending. And I'll send out the recording in the next day or so. So if you want to uh, watch it again, you'll be able to watch the recording. You can just go to the Wake Up with Zest YouTube channel, or the recordings are on the Zest Wellbeing Hub under Zestcast. So have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you.